Welcome to Conlang Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Meesley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the collaborative con pigeon, Viosa. I'm going to be doing something pretty different for this episode, because Viosa is a special case. I mean, for one, it's somewhat ambiguous whether or not it can be called a conlang. What I usually do is research a conlang until I know enough about it to develop an informed opinion and then talk about it. But for Viosa, I can't really do that. So I did something else instead. I spoke to several members of the Viosa community about their experiences with the language, because one of the most amazing and unique things about Viosa is the amount of variety that exists within the language, how much of it is different from person to person. So I decided that the best way to present this language would be to show it from a bunch of different perspectives. I am Salt. I am a linguistics student. I'm also into language learning. I speak Finnish and English natively. I also speak Japanese and Spanish. Japanese was my major contribution language for Viosa, and we can get into what exactly that means in a little bit. I was basically the most, I guess, responsible for Viosa forming. I was the founding member and stuff. Hi, my name is Pauli. I'm from Finland, and I'm actually a musician, but I'm conlanging because I'm into making my own fictional world, and that got me into conlanging, and that got me into linguistics. I'm Jana, and I have been in the Viosa community, I suppose, Nearly since the beginning, basically a week after it started. I'm Nico Miko. I live in Florida near Tampa Bay. I'm a saxophonist. I'm in school for like, I've been back and forth between music and linguistics for the past couple years at USF. I came in like a week into things. My name is Tibitsky. I joined the Viosa Discord server pretty recently, like last month, and I've already made quite a lot of progress with the help of the community. I am Pancake, and I've been speaking Viosa for probably, I think, like two, three months now. I'm a native English speaker, and I have taken three years of high school Spanish. My username is PK Omelette. I live in Belgium. I study classical languages and literature, and I speak French natively. Of course, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't have been able to make a video about Viosa just by reading about it. Because by design, Viosa is very poorly documented. The only way to learn Viosa is through immersion, and by extension, the only way to learn about Viosa is directly from its speakers. So then, what is Viosa? Viosa is a very unique language experiment. It's this collaborative project that's been going on for five or six years at this point. The main purpose of it at the beginning was a collaborative con pigeon, basically trying to create a pigeon basically by not speaking any English. And for those of you who are watching who aren't familiar, a pidgin is basically a language that forms via contact between other languages. And so the experiment was to see if a pidgin could be formed online by people speaking different languages and trying not to use any shared language, just to see what would happen, whether we would establish any kind of understanding. Which is kind of emulating circumstances where different language populations meet each other and start forming a language because they need to communicate somehow. I like to call pigeons nature's oxlangs because they naturally develop in this type of situation where an auxiliary language is necessary. <laughs> that is quite a, an accurate way of calling pigeons. And well, yes, is the end result of all that. So the result is essentially like a hybrid language built off of like a dozen or so like main languages that we pulled vocabulary and syntax from. The basic idea is if you can make yourself understood in Viosa, then it is Viosa. So there's no set standard for it. How does that begin like for like the first couple of sessions? Video calls was the answer to that because it's very easy to visually show items or actions, maybe even adjectives, but it didn't take too long until we were able to also describe new words with words that we already knew. The project originally started on Christmas Eve 2014. It was on a Skype group, which sprung out of the original Con Skype group as well. And the original starting group was about 10 people. A lot of the people have dropped off completely, so it's a bit of a mystery who all was involved in the beginning. Due to the lack of a single standard version of Yosa, I can't do the thing I always do on Conline Critic where I make charts of all the phonemes and read through them. Fortunately, as I was talking to Salp, she said, Actually, if you don't mind, I'm gonna really quickly 
just write out what the phonology is for oh, me. Oh, go for it. It's yeah. going to take like one second, but I don't want to like miss anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, love that. Yeah, go I, for it. I assume it's going to be edited out. Or oh, yeah. This is, if I don't edit parts out of these interviews, this video is going to be about five hours long. Do you want me to pronounce my own phonology or <laughs> just list it out? Do you want me to send it to you? I mean, I mean yeah, post it and then we can have the, we can do the thing where you read it out. For my phonology in particular, I use m, n, n, p, t, k, n, b, d, g, t, ch, z, f, s, sh, h, h, v, z, z, w, y, r, l. I think the most marginal phoneme that I specifically use is the glottal stop, which I happen to have in a few words simply because I contributed like a handful of words from Ainu back when I was studying it for a tiny bit. So I have the glottal stop phoneme in a few of those words, and I don't think anyone else does, but it's possible that they also have glottal stops in some places. And then there's je, which is actually a lot more common, but I don't usually use it. I sometimes do, but most of the time I replace it with the affricate. So I think that's the most, I think, notable thing as well, that I happen to lack something that most people do have. Ma, as in min. Na, as in namae. Nga, as in ring. Ba, as in ber. Ba, as in böse. Ta, as in ting. Da, as in dan. Ka, as in ga. Ga, as in gammel. Fa, as in für. Va, as in wie. Tha, as in taten. Sa as in sama, za as in zan, sha as in pashun, ja as in jin, ha as in macha, ra as in rö, la as in lid, ya as in yam, wa as in wasu, cha as in chisai. I guess one of the basic things is I absolutely have a trill for my rhotic, especially if it's at the end of a syllable. I have a voiceless dental fricative in some places, although that tends to be pretty rare. A lot of other people's varieties of yosa, for the words that the loans did have a voiceless dental fricative, replace it with the tsa, the Africa. There is one thing that I tried to do at some point, which was that all the ch and j consonants would be th and th in my dialect, but it didn't really catch on, so I went back. I think I did it mostly because I like the letters Thorn and Ed. <laughs> I mean, I guess my dialect it sticks somewhat closely to a basic Germanic sounding phonology, I suppose. Pa, ba, ta, da, ta, da, ka, ga, a, ma, na, nga, r, ra, fa, va, Sa, za, sha, ja, sha, ja, sha, ja, hyam, ha, ha, ye, le, le, tse, 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 tse. The way the experiment is designed, we all pulled from a particular language to contribute. And so the idea would be that primarily our phonology would be based on that language, like the donation language that we were using. However, there are a couple of caveats to that. Firstly, that like we all speak English. So I think the native speakers of English, they're not going to have the most accurate presentation in that language. For instance, I speak English primarily, but my contribution language is Russian. So my phonology would be highly like Russian influenced but also like I speak English primarily and then because we're in a setting where we're linguistically aware in the first place like we know about phonology we can just talk about it we would hear things that other people would do and adapt them but the result is it's a Russian phonology filtered through English and then with little bits pulled from the phonologies of other speakers. Then there's also the velar fricative. There's h, which I think usually shows up as an allophone of h, but again, it's not completely clear cut. There are some words where it doesn't happen, some words where it can happen. It's all very fluid. If h precedes a vowel, then I pronounce it as h. If it's at the end of a syllable, then I pronounce it as I would in German, like ach, if it follows a back vowel, or ich, if it follows a front vowel. Yeah, I honestly can't even tell if, like, the vowel fricative is one or two phonemes. So I'm not sure if h, the velar, is, is a different phoneme. I don't think it is. And for vowels, I have i, u, u, e, e. Oh, ah, 
the fact that I have a central high vowel in there. I'm not defining specifically what it is because often it is also unrounded to some extent and not necessarily fully central. So it usually is a mix of something like a front rounded vowel from Germanic languages and the Japanese U kind of coalescing into a single thing, contrasting with a more full like U sound. That's also something that some people never do, some people always do, and I just don't bother caring whether I do it or not. And so we have E, U, E, U, A, 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 O, U. And those can all be either long or short. Because I speak German, I have some vowel contrast that other people don't have. Huske, I pronounce that with an U, but other people usually say Huske with an U sound. And that contrasts for me with uh, U as in Höre. I, E, Ö, Ä, A, E, J, Ü, 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 Ö, A, U, O, O, E, A, I. O, U, E, A, I. In addition to that, there's also vowel length and gemination for a lot of speakers, including myself. It simply means that the length of a sound has an impact on the meaning of a word. Even people who speak different languages that have length distinction, they hear length differences differently. Some speakers will also turn that into something like a tense lax distinction. Some people will turn that into like stress or pitch accent. One of the first words to enter the language had a syllabic esh in it. The word fishto became basically solidified that way for most speakers immediately. So there was really no backing out of that. That's just how it ended up. Some people might insert like an epithetic vowel. I found it hard to pronounce for me. So I decided to pronounce it fashto. It also looks more like Dutch, which I'm more familiar with. It started out, as far as I recall, with the like schwa in the beginning, like fashto, fashto. Like in the original languages, there was like a gap there. But like it has never been important what vowel is there. Like Salp used to say fushto, fushto, as though it was from Japanese. I did that for a while and I tried writing it, but it started to look bad. Everybody else wasn't doing it, so... You know, I had to adapt. I don't even really know what I did, but like sometimes you'll hear like a, a rhotic in there almost, like just a regular old English rhotic, like for stool, <laughs> which I think is just amusing. As far as like general phonotactics go, it is kind of unlimited because it's all determined by what the donor languages happen to provide and what the people decide to accept. It is very loose, but it somehow works. The differences in the phonology between each person, but there's also the differences in orthography of those same words. And so sometimes, for me, I would read two people talking, and they would respond to each other with what looked like different words. But as I found out later, once I became a little bit more fluent, it was just a spelling difference. Well, of course, probably everybody tries to spell the way they pronounce. I don't really have a set orthography. Usually I just use whatever spelling I learn first. That leads to lots of inconsistencies in my spelling. As I notice distinctions, I'll try and write them for some time. Then if I realize that it's just not working for me, I'll discard it. It was created by people gathering together and speaking orally to each other. So it was developed by speech and it was not written on a page or set on a rock or anyway. The actual name in the language, Viosa. Most people spell that V-I-O-S-S-A, but I spell it V-J-O-S-S-A. I do write the way I pronounce and it's also inspired by Finnish spelling in that length the distinction is always a double letter, just like in Finnish. Some of the ways I've seen it done, you can either double the bass vowel, you can use an acute accent, or the overline like Latin will do, or just some people don't write them at all. Some people don't have long vowels. I have a written long vowel distinction, but not a spoken one, for example. Some people use particular digraphs, others will use diacritics. I don't use diacritics. For one word, for example, I wrote it like that with a Macron, and I think I saw the same word with a Y. For the vowel U, I tend to use the slash, and for a, I tend to use a with umlauts for, I guess, consistency somewhat. Wait, that's not consistent. <laughs> right. Either way. 
<laughs> Most people have a language that they loan words into Vyosa from. So mine were Old English and later also Gothic. I also supplied some words from Swedish, which I know a bit of also, and Northern Sami, which I don't know. <laughs> I have been using Japanese in Viosa since the beginning. My contribution languages, actually I had two. It was Russian and Old Norse. Like I just had an Old Norse book for a little while. I would say the most influence comes from Japanese, Russian, Norwegian, Finnish, Albanian, Greek, Swiss German. Finnish, Albanian, Greek, Japanese, a lot of Japanese, a lot of Norwegian, Swiss German, Old English Gothic, Russian, That's basically the major set of languages. Some of those people are not even active at this point anymore, though, so the language continues to evolve in very different directions as time goes on. When you're trying to teach a word to everybody else, and you have the accurate idea of the meaning of the word, and then the other people, they get it slightly wrong, but then they say that they got it. So you think they got it. One specific example of, like, a word changing meaning is... I tried to introduce the word, the adjective bright. So I took a light and I just shone it towards the camera. It's bright, of course, but everybody took it to mean light. (laughs) I'll come across a word and recognize it. And I'm like, okay, I know what this is. But it's not always that simple because just like any other language that exists for any significant amount of time, there's semantic drift and differences in its usage, etc. If you stop speaking Viosa for a year or so, you may return to find that basic things that you thought you understood are gone and you have to scramble to understand things again. I found that abbreviated words were sometimes abbreviated in the same way Japanese would take a syllable from the first part and then a syllable from the second part and then just make a word that's the first syllable of each part. At the beginning, I was very hesitant to shorten words, but eventually I gave in and now I shorten words all the time. One of the big examples of that is pashun, which I shorten to pash sometimes. Kotoba, because it's such a common word and it's very big, people have a tendency to shorten it to either koto or simply ko. And this tends to happen even more so in compounding, because compound words in Viosa get very massive when you have a small selection of vocab to draw from. So one of the most common words that we use, kotoba libre, when people want to talk about their own personal dictionaries, tend to shorten it to kotoli, because why not? There's also examples of words that have preserved their older form in a compound, but in other situations, people just use an abbreviated version or whatever. So basically, things fossilize here and there, other things shift. It is very unsystematic, and I think that describes the whole spirit of the project pretty well. Another word with an interesting history, the word in my idiolect, it's verja. Other people pronounce it farge. Some other people pronounce it farje. Some more other people pronounce it Varge. So you can see where I'm going with this. It has like a bunch of different realizations depending on who you're talking to. And my variant is Verja. It wasn't like purposeful at all. Like that's just how I heard the word. I think vocab nowadays tends to rely more on derivations rather than borrowing for two reasons. First of all, it's easier to remember. You know, if you haven't seen a word before, but it is based on parts that you already recognize, you'll keep it in mind a lot easier. And the second one is literally just that it's better than, you know, relying on something Latin if we have to refer to anything more complex. You know, we would rather have it be more purely viosa if possible. No English. And on that, Latinate words were and still are disencouraged. The convenient thing about using Japanese as a contribution language is that when everybody else has something Latinate because everybody else is using European languages, I'll often be the one who comes in and is like, okay, we're using something to make it less Englishy. Because of that, Japanese has often been like the fallback, which is why there's so much of it. There was a moment when I realized that this moment is when we can start using Viosa to describe Viosa. It was like just a few weeks after the project started and we were able to start like defining words, explaining words, explaining grammar with Viosa itself. So that reduced the need for video calls like almost completely. 
Overall, I would describe Vios as very isolating. There aren't a lot of, or really any forms that I can think of where it goes beyond reduction when you combine morphemes. It hasn't progressed to the point where these forms like merge into something totally new. It's just like lots of combination happens. Viosa, which doesn't have much overt marking for much of anything, was a really weird experience. Because the word order is still incredibly free in a sense. There'll be some times where I'm speaking in a very English manner with like very subject, verb, object, always, every time. Other days I'll do strange things where I have like verbs in like three different orders depending on the sentence. The grammar of Yosa resembles a lot of pigeons in that it is quite isolating. It's quite non-configurational as well, so there's not a lot of rigid rules. And a lot of that is because we have not established rigid rules ever <laughs> by writing them out and being like, this is the rule, you have to follow it. People, of course, have many variations in their grammar, but in general, it's very isolating. We tend to rely more on particles and add positions and things like that rather than, you know, complex cases or verb conjugations and things like that. Even though I live in Belgium and not in France, I still speak French, which means there is one authority for French, l'Académie Française. They have a strong influence on how people see new ways of saying things. I came into Viosa. Immediately, you see in the first rule, if you are understood, it's correct Viosa. And that immediately changes everything about how you treat the language itself. And that was a really important lesson for me, and also just almost liberating. Not having to, like, study a grammar and know exactly every rule was kind of freeing in a sense, I would say. The goal is more comprehension, if you can put words together in an order and somebody understands it, it's probably correct. Another thing is that there is no copula. Other people might use a copula for clarification purposes, but I personally just no copula. One of the very early rules was no copula. <laughs> it seems like that has become less cared about, although it is still a overriding tendency for speakers in the language to not use a copula. But at the beginning, copulas were forbidden in the that language. It seems so counter to like the spirit. Alongside, of how... there was no copula, and alongside that, no English loans. Those two rules were like right next but to each other. But if you loan is, then that cancels out. True. Because everyone knew English, everyone had English to fall back on. So even if they provided a non-Indo-European language, it's just kind of how it came out. In Vyosa, there really isn't much of a tense system. There are particles that convey time, though. They started out as words, and they still are used as words in some places, but they've largely become sort of particles that convey either pastness or futureness or presentness. Uh, Viosa has prepositions, it has a lot of prepositions, and it has also postpositions that aren't always used that way. Not everybody uses them as postpositions. One of the features that Viosa has that I haven't really encountered in any Natlang before is the opposition between the adpositions. I'm using ambiguous terminology for a reason here. De and za. So the way we always explain these is by putting them in between numbers. Ein, de, ni, de, tre, tre, za, ni, de, ein. That should be mostly self-explanatory, but the thing with that is it shows a very specific use case. You're not usually listing events purely like that. Usually you want to use words like this at the beginning of a sentence or before a subclause or all sorts of situations which do not clearly lend themselves towards such a listing. So for about five years now, People have not known how to use these words. People use these words and kind of understand what the other person is saying sometimes, but there's a lot of disagreement. So this has led to the word deza to mean something that is just such a mess that nobody has any idea how to use it. The following is a section of a conversation between Salp and Nico Miko, which they kindly recorded specifically so I could use it as the Viosa sample in this video. Now, I will note that up until this point, I've been avoiding direct translations, which is because if anyone watching this video decides that they want to actually learn Viosa, direct translations can be considered spoilers. However, this sample section will in fact be translated, so if you want to avoid spoilers, skip to the timecode on screen. Akrat, akrat. Mange, um, apar, apar chigao hanasutrapos, lik. Mange F, mange F. 
Au, 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 au. Mange es. Und äh, ne, ne, stimmt. Fa, a, fa, fa, a, fa. Ah, oh, akkurat. Fa, 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 fa. Akkurat, Likoske und Hanau, Afto, 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 in a kuchi. Ka ishi ne kuchi. Ah, hamas. Hamas, Men. Mm. Ishi ne kuchi. Ishi ne kuchi. Men, do you have a done after Perun? Do you have a Klaus. Men. Nai shiru le Klaus. Shiru after Kotoba. Hamas. Nai shiru. Ishi lichting. Akkurat, akkurat is het niet. Men ligt ook mange, mange zuid ischke. Nee, harmerai is je leek hamas. Harmerai, harmerai mange voor voor hamas. Akkurat, triest. Nee, mange bra. Nee, mange bra, onharacht ook problemen paar. Ah, triest, dat moest, dat moest. Akkurat. Hamas douche. Hamas Doji, akkurat. Hamas Doji, 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 Hamas Stoff, schoi exo, du schiro, exo küchi, au, in a, in a alplas, koske, lik, ander, ander person so jitting, lik, gomen, und nei will dann men tul, men, men slucha dann, de, nei har after problem in a, in a duscha. Pravda. Hm. So jitting und aber man gehasst der Wardag, das slucha, men, brag wie har, simpel fu, fu immer da gwona, Ah, oh, Hermann is ke in een douche room. Kadeki. Fix <laughs> alting per wie. <laughs> Akkurat. Akkurat, mange bra. Mange bra. Bra, bra, hano die dan. Vios is quite an unusual conlang project. In that it wasn't intended as a conlang, it was intended as an experiment. And it formed mostly naturally, in that not much of it was consciously put together. Obviously, there are some things that had a lot of conscious influence because it was mostly conlingers with linguistics knowledge, but the majority of it was just what people put together. As an experiment, it was flawed. Everybody who was participating spoke English and also had certain languages in common, even if they weren't using them. Honestly, I think the absence of monolinguals who don't speak English, I think that's one thing that, like, it's not something that I despise about the language or anything. It's just an unfortunate side effect of the way it was put together. Like, I feel like the experience would be, like, so much more of a diverse, like, cultural exchange if we were able to do that. Unfortunately, I think it was just out of scope for the project, really. It's kind of hard sometimes to know how much is cheating because they say, like, no English is one of the big rules of Viosa, and yet will use like images and emojis all the time. Is that cheating? I know nowadays it's kind of frowned upon to use emojis or like pictures of objects to find out what something means, but I honestly <laughs> I honestly don't really care. <laughs> Go ahead. I find that like even in circumstances where <laughs> I figured out a word through nefarious means <laughs> There's always something new to learn and figure out how to express as long as you just continue applying the ethical rules. Like if you strive not to correct people when the distinction isn't important, for instance, then you have the possibility to completely relearn that word that you cheated to figure out. Beyond that, the as a calling, well, it's not a very interesting calling. The grammar is pretty Indo-European, so that's kind of boring. Even though we're speaking with all these words from all these different languages, we tended to use 
English syntax a lot because syntax is not an equally obvious part of language, even though it's of course equally important. Honestly, like if somebody just sent me a random grammar of this and said it was their conlang, I would probably be absolutely disgusted and not have any interest whatsoever. But that wasn't Vyosa's goal. So that's our excuse. I don't think two speakers of Vyosa would write all words exactly the same way at all. It's like a language that is being used with a community that is very close-knit and we all know each other for a long time. I think that's honestly one of the big keys to the Vyosa success is that we were the friends that all liked linguistics. God, I love the community. Honestly, just the closeness of things, because everybody has relearned how to speak with each other, and in such an intimate and kind of like loving way. You know those other people you're friendly with them, and you have your own secret language with them. I've been using it for five years. I've made friends in the project that I wouldn't have met otherwise. It just is very cool to have seen the experiment unfold and having that experience of trying to struggle to communicate and establishing language. That's not something that really a lot of people experience in their lifetimes. The main way of learning of the language is immersion, which is something that you almost never get with any other language. I just think it's really cool, and I'm in a sense kind of thankful that I'm part of the community, I suppose. But I'm also glad that I've been able to share it with everyone in a way. You know what I love? Hmm. This is the seventh of these interviews I've done. Uh -huh. So far, 100% of people have said that they love the Viosa community. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is so wonderful and wholesome hearing people talk <laughs> about how they've made friends over the course of learning this language. And every single person I've talked to about Viosa has said that. That's so fun. I love that. That warms my heart to hear so much because like since I've been around so long, it pleases me so deeply to know that like new people and older speakers as well, we've been able to continue having that experience with each other. I think that's really fabulous. I remember <laughs> I remember we were at these cliffs over the ocean and we're just like hanging out. So we start like talking in Viosa for fun. We see a lizard and I think one of us is like, I wonder what the Viosa word for this should be or something like that. So I'm like, I'm going to come up with one. And so I just flip out my phone and I <laughs> search up like an old English translation for it. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> this is an authics. And so now the word for lizard is authics because we were hanging out one day and we saw a lizard and didn't have a word for it already. So <laughs> it's now an authics. All in all, I am so grateful that I got the opportunity to talk to the Viosa community. That said, I don't really know if I have any real opinions on the language itself. Talking about what I like or don't like about its design and its aesthetic feels like it would just be missing the point, you know? The fact that Viosa exists is a direct side effect of my absolute favorite trait of humanity, the innate desire to communicate with one another. Viosa reminded me why I love linguistics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll be reviewing English. <laughs> Oh, tell them I saw